Buongiorno a tutti, al pubblico in sala e a coloro che ci stanno seguendo su Webstream, sul sito, e benvenuti a Markets. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and welcome to Markets for People, competitiveness and uh, uh, rules and the service of our society. Now, I am from Modena, even if I've been traveling around the world for 25 years. Well, this is the best place to start. I mean, there's no uh, experiment of DG competition from the European uh, Commission. Now, as for rules, we've been uh, familiar with this for some centuries. Uh, in the Piazza Grande, the main square, behind the church or the cathedral, you can see uh, the typical Modena units of measure, the tile, the brick, the arm, and the cane. I mean, just to be uh, uh, sure that the uh, you know, competition rule of the market, uh, you know, the market was held in the hay market, which is the so-called Piazza Grande. Now, today's event is open to the public, so this is a difference uh, you know, from, let's say, European institutions, because, of course, we would like to, you know, to get closer and closer to people. We will have two rounds of presentations from our speakers. As I said before, the event is held in Italian, but we also have uh, web streaming uh, with the translation into English. So uh, I know that we, we do have some, I mean, English-speaking uh, persons. You can keep your mobile phones on, but in silent mode. This is useful for Slido because you may want to comment or to post questions because after the two rounds, uh, we will also have a Q&A session. The code is hashtag So, hashtag markets for people. Once again, uh, benvenuti, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Mozzarelli, the mayor of the city of Modena. Welcome to Modena. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to open this very important meeting for us because this will help us start a public debate, if you will, that the uh, General Direction or Directorate competition from the European Union decided to start, and we started, I mean, from our city, Modena. So we would like to open the European government to relationships with long-established stakeholders, but at the same time, we want to do this with citizens. I think this is a very important point. I think Modena is a European city. We want to, as we say in Italia, we want to keep our heads in Europe. And, um, you know, this is what we do here in this room every two years with, uh, um, you know, a big, big, uh, you know, effort from, you know, Renzo Imbeni's summer school. We'd like to mention Renzo Imbeni for the passion, the strength of his European, very open-minded thoughts. Today, we will be talking about competition, the uh, competition policies uh, in our life, and especially in the life of people. Now, these topics are still crucial because they have an impact on the life of citizens and the companies of our community. Um, we do this with real, actual, um, you know, stakeholders working, uh, you know, on the market every single day. And I'm sure this is important. So, let me, let me thank the European Commission. Um, also, would like to thank our Europe Direct Center here in Modena, always, uh, you know, willing to, you know, work with European authorities. Uh, I got a question a couple of minutes ago. Uh, what uh, do you do in, you know, this this um, department? Well, speaking to Europe, as we say, uh, well, this is one of the daily uh, actions that we perform every single day. 
you know, all the uh, managers and the, uh, you know, uh, partners from that office, well, they know that they have to tell the people in Modena what Brussels uh, wants. At the same time, we also have the budget issue. And of course, I am the watchdog of their budget. So once again, benvenuti. Welcome to our wonderful city with plenty of, you know, our beautiful monuments and passions. When we attended the uh, Expo in Milan in 2015, eight years ago, we conveyed a key message. This is the Ferrari Pavarotti land slow food plus fast cars. This is what uh, Modena is made up of. So please do enjoy our city. Um, we also have to make sure markets work with the help of people. We do need to talk about competition. So from our constitutional charter all the way to hands-on approaches. So, so much pressure and even so much time to make decisions. I'm sharing these words with Mr. Bersani and thank you so much for being here because this is what you've tried. It was not an easy adventure, not at all. Um, you know, a government uh, representing, you know, the central um, part of the Italian politics or even the left side, uh, you know, on the other side uh, there are many, well, let's say corporations as we say. Anyway, the territories here in Emilia, Romagna and Modena do represent the way in which competition has put together rules plus freedom. This means economic developments and a very high rate of employment. Now, uh, Europe uh, has to uh, knock at the door because um, we, need, we need a new strategy. For example, inclusion policies for immigrants, um, policies in terms of you know, job, labor, education, uh, right salaries for people. Of course, we don't want to have competition on the job market, so we have to find the right conditions so as to put together training, education and top quality uh, professions. This means freedom for companies being able to develop a Europe that has to be more robust, stronger now, because, you know, uh, because this is what the world wants because once again, uh, the war in Ukraine needs our help. And even the world that has changed. I mean, uh, we are helping the new international balance. All together, we have to go to China, not individually, so that we can become stronger to find a peaceful solution. This is my last point. Um, on May the 9th, uh, we will be celebrating the 8th um, anniversary of the uh, Schumer uh, Declaration. Uh, the French ministry uh, put forward this idea, I mean, creating the so-called CECA, so the European Community on Steel. Uh, now, this was the first step when it comes to, you know, European Union. Uh, we came from the Second World War. So many countries, for example, Italy, were very poor. They had to be rebuilt and reconstructed. The economy was so weak and feeble, if you will. This region, Emilia, Romagna and Modena, uh, well, we were uh, in a very, let's say, poor condition, while now the situation has completely changed. So more than 80 years of peace and progress with the right constitutional charter. Now, this means that we found the right spaces for the market, for people, freedom of action, which are absolutely crucial. Now, we have to work to get the trust of citizens, so we have to work so that we can once again create new opportunities, new cultural integration, economic integration and social integration as well. I think today's meeting is so important, it will be another spur and encouragement to what we do every single day. We will have authoritative speakers uh, this morning, and thank you so much for being here. Our focus and attention level will be very high. In our urban plan, we wrote that the future is now. In June, we will approve this new cutting-edge tool 
there will be modern relationships. Uh, we will be talking about the responsibilities of public and private partnerships. Together, they will um, create the strategies for the future. So, a public government, of course, but we will, you know, go on uh, together. So, rights, rules, uh, willingness, uh, sustainable growth, uh, a green, long-lasting growth. It has to be sustainable for everyone. We want to be an open, inclusive community. This is why I'd like to say thank you for this meeting. And uh, I'm sure that the meeting will be very fruitful for all of us because we all need to, to have new thoughts. Uh, we need to develop actions for the goods of our communities. Thank you so much. Mr. Mozzarelli, thank you so much. Mr. Mozzarelli, once again, is the mayor of the city of Modena. So rules uh, will help the market. Can I have now um, Mr. Stecconi? Uh, he will be moderating the uh, two rounds. Mr. Stecconi is from the uh, DG competition and he's the, uh, let's say, creator, if you will, of this initiative. Good morning, everyone. So, I'd like to thank the Mayor, Mr. Mussarelli, the City of Modena, the Europe, the Red Center, the uh, authority that represents the competition, and uh, many other you know, bodies. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this opportunity today. Now, as you know, this is not just representing, let's say, one force only, one person only, but this is a team. I'd like to thank the European Commission representative office in Italy, the Brussels team that we have in the room, and they are also listening to us from Brussels. We also have Pomilio Blum, our contractors, and all the people who are working for us today, so the hostesses, and then all the people taking care of the audio and video recordings and many other partners. Uh, I need to thank you. Um, and uh, I'm sure many people are taking advantage of our streaming service. I'm sure this will be a um, passionate debate. As Matteo said before, be ready. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the second round of questions with Slido. Now, I should have uh, started by thanking speakers today. Now, we exchanged uh, uh, some messages. Now, they know what we have done in the uh, DG competition with their help. So, we have given a tangible meaning to the debate that will start soon, plus four more debates um, uh, to follow in many different countries of Europe in the next 12 months. Well, this is something new because we are doing something unique in our field. Just like, you know, the feeling of an you know, untapped, uh, unexplored island. We talked about protecting, you know, competition to strengthen the uh, single market. This is the real, you know, uh, well, beating heart of today's meeting. The antitrust European authorities are public independent bodies and they are representing the interests of citizens. So with their actions, they foster the um, equity, both economic and social, uh, you know, uh, equality to citizens. You can read this in a very important document, our National um, Recovery and Resilience Plan. The document says uh, a fundamental factor for equality and economic growth is the promotion and protection of competition. Competition meets uh, the market demands. 
but it can also give us social justice. You can find these words in the introduction of the document. So once again, growth and equality. Market logics plus social justice. So hundreds of pages later, you can also see substantial equality. Now, substantial means uh, uh, not a theoretical equality, but an actual real equality. So speakers will be talking about this today. Once again, grazie. Thank you so much for being here. May I have your attention on the fact that no speakers are coming from Brussels, so I am the only one. So I ask questions, I don't give answers. And I will also be the timekeeper this morning. Now, the European Commission is a sort of uh, reporter. We are traveling around Europe to know what people think and say about uh, well-regulated, uh, fair, equitable markets. We won't go to capital towns or big cities. Now, this is my last topic. Uh, you know, this is the first debate held here in Italy. I'd like to open, you know, a debate for a passionate uh, discussion on a topic that's uh, sort of neglected. Almost never we take into account the actual facts. So we almost never listen to all the perspectives when we talk about competition. Quite often, you know, we just listen to, you know, one of the many bells ringing, so to say. So I'm really very glad and happy because, I mean, Mrs. Mr. Mozzarelli is helping us together with many other organizations. Thank you so much for helping us launch this system from this city. When we met some days ago, you said, I'm so happy you will come here because we need you know, ideas to travel, to circulate, to be exchanged. So our hope today is that for one day, Moderna, with its uh, incredible economic strength and civic tradition, Moderna is and will be the city where we will be talking about uh, what to do in the markets uh, so as to help people. For one day, Moderna will become the Italian capital of the protection of competition and of citizens. Thank you. Ubaldo Stacconi, thank you so much. Please stay here with us. Also would like to draw your attention onto this Lorenzetti painting. So, we're still here after thousands of years. We are still painting men. So we have men painting men. Now, this is a, a, a pilot meeting. This is a new initiative. And the key objective is to change, you know, the uh, pace uh, in the European Commission, especially in the DG competition. Without further ado, let me invite our speakers, Professor Michele Polo from the Bocconi University. Pierluigi Bersani, politician and writer. Welcome, Mr. Bassani. Silvia Shorilli Borelli is a reporter from the Financial Times. Anna Argentati from the Antitrust Commission. Last but not least, Sara De Simoni, Tetra Pak CEO, Packaging Solutions. Vice President's Innovation.
Thank you, Matteo. So, question number one is for Professor Polo. Now, um, can you just open the debate, please, and give us, I mean, some you know basic um, background of the topics uh, um, today. So, my question for you is, what do we mean by uh, level? playing field. Can you also expand on the risks and benefits of an economy and a society that's been, you know, supported by uh, open and well-regulated markets, including the perception of risks and benefits? Grazie. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really would like to thank the conveners and uh, the city. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. So this is my, you know, profession, competition, and uh, once again, it's a pleasure once again to be here. Competition. This is today's topic. Now, uh, it may sound abstract, uh, intangible, or even, uh, you know, very complex, uh, multifaceted. Now, this is a topic that's been, you know, um, dealt with by, you know, politics, uh, maybe a little far away from the life of citizens. Now, to start the ball rolling today, I'd like to share with you the, um, I mean, a short story. Um, I have invented, I mean, this character. And then this person, uh, let's say, encounters the different aspects of competition in people's daily life. Now, this character has to solve a problem. He has to repaint uh, his apartment. Idea number one, mm, get in touch with a painting company. In a very formal way, saying, can you please repaint my rooms? then you can tell me how much I owe you. He doesn't like this person, then he gets in touch with two more companies. He specifies, I mean, which kind of service he wants. So the color, the type of paint, the time window available. So he needs um, a quote, I mean, an offer from, let's say, the two companies. And then he says, please, can I have good conditions? Because, you know, um, you are the only person I'm asking the question to. So he's very happy and goes back to work. Now, why was he happy? Well, because quite, you know, possibly, and based, you know, on his experience, expertise, um, in order, if you want, to solve the problem, which is, you know, repainting the walls of the rooms of his apartment, um, he has created some competition. Just a small tender, if you will, because now we have two companies sending two offers. So they have to offer the uh, right, uh, you know, economic conditions, and at the same time, they have to comply with the technical specifications um, that the customer requires. So let's pretend that this person has been working in a company uh, in the catering industry for the city's schools uh, canteens. They have been doing this for quite a long time. The owner has uh, a good relationship with some you know, uh, officials um, in the town hall. So there was no tender, there was a direct contact and contract. Unfortunately, um, he goes to his office and the old, uh, you know, um, secretary retired. The new one, after getting a degree uh, in economics, decided to open a tender for these services. And they are looking for, you know, the company that offers, I mean, the best uh, price and conditions. 
Now, our friend, our character, well, is worried. What happens if we don't win? Because, you know, we've been working with that supplier for many, many years. And, uh, well, once again, this may be a problem because maybe another, you know, supplier may win. So the previous supplier may lose the tender and another one, a new one, may win it. In the tender, there will be other companies. Maybe they have, you know, temporary labor contracts with professionals. So probably costs for some other participants are lower than the previous costs. You know, our staff uh, has been there for, you know, many years. And so the, uh, you know, salary levels, uh, the, the uh, remuneration levels may be higher. So we have basically two different situations. We have two painting companies for the house of our character in order to solve, you know, the painting problem. On the other side, we have a tender for the canteen or, you know, a catering service. So possibly uh, he will have to, you know, change his, you know, professional relationships. Anyway, let me let me close this example. Otherwise, it gets too too complicated, maybe uh, boring. But just imagine the complexity and the different levels competition works on. So we have users on the one side, for example, our character. But on the other side, we also have, you know, the second uh, part, or if you will, or phase of the same coin, which is the catering services for the children of the school. So we have to come to terms with quality of the service and innovation. And again, at the same time, this may generate uncertainties, because this is due to the fact that, that competition is a turbulent uh, mechanism. So, when talking about competition, um, we have to consider the positive sides of this system. On the other side, we have to understand exactly all the mechanisms that put together good or even best supply conditions. On the other side, we have to mitigate the uncertainties and even risks because, you know, uh, markets with high competition may be risky. This is it for my first speech and um, in a second round I will expand on this balance, if you will, between on the one side the positive sides of competition, on the other side protecting the interests of citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well deserved that round of applause because you've spoken very clearly of such a complex situation. Mr. Bersani, uh, everyone knows why Mr. Bersani is here. I mean, you have represented for many years uh, the Italian uh, government introducing pro competition policies. Uh, can we say liberalizations, uh, reforms, let's say uh, opening markets, uh, uh, dismantling old positions? And uh, this is what happens, uh, uh, let's say, in two different time windows, 88, 89, then 2006 to 2007. So, um, can we just get, you know, deep inside? So. What encouraged you at that time to, uh, you know, have these reforms? And uh, what, what, what was the context, the political and social context like um, around the government in those years? Well, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the question. Um, Now, um, 
I've always had some very clear ideas in my mind. Now, um, I like to use the word liberalizations. Now, liberalizations uh, is the contrary, the opposite of deregulation. This is what we said before. Markets, physically, are places of rules. So, uh, after doing barters in the woods, well, the second step was the market. So, barter first, market later. We need to, to have standards, rules, tax rules, access rules, and so on and so forth. So, this, you know, a regulatory framework um, has um, become more and more complex. Inside these markets, we don't want to have privileged positions. Uh, the names were dominant positions or monopolies or, you know, barriers uh, created by um, corporations. Now, a well-regulated market is uh, fighting back against uh, the power of the market. We have to be protected against uh, the overpower of the market. I'm using this word, I mean power, but that's something which is even more physiological. In very simple words, uh, any entrepreneur um, would like to sleep with the angels in the night. So, looking for protection, looking for shelter, I understand this is natural. I can also understand this, but when you organize too much power, no, this is not good. Now, um, some years ago, Mm, you know, when I created some reforms, so we also created a nice word in Italian, lenzuolo latte. Uh, now, lenzuolo is the bed linen. And this is what, you know, some people used to protest against me. You know, they used the linen with some, you know, words written on them. Now, don't forget, I went through 1968. And then uh, I also remember the 1970s uh, uh, urban plan in the city of Parma. This is what people did to protest. They used the bed linen, one close to another, in every, uh, you know, flag, as we say. There was a different, uh, you know, topic. So I use the word the lenzuolate, so showing, you know, bed linen, um, they are free, you know, people complained about banks, insurance companies, telephone companies. I mean, it was a way to, you know, to show um, this agreement. Now, don't want to make a, a list which would be too long, but just think of the so-called portability of uh, um, mortgages. It was incredible for me to discover that there was a mechanism that if everything goes well, you know, banks uh, make money. Uh, if things don't go well, citizens lose money. And I said, are you kidding me? Is this serious? Of course, people complained heavily. So they started, you know, doing some competition and then, you know, this uh, changed the approach of banks. Uh, as for portable telephones, maybe you remember here in Italy there was a five euro tax every time you wanted to, uh, you know, uh, 
increase your, your credit, I mean, to recharge it. I remember a phone call from an international telephone operator. So this person came to my office saying, Minister, if this is confirmed, I have to fire 500 people. And I said, Dear Mr. Sawiris, this conversation stops here because uh, I cannot accept this. So he left right away. Now, people um, remember the words written on the linen. You know, there's a sick side of the word liberalization because if you liberalize vouchers or you know the so-called cascading self-contracting well you are not protecting citizens you are protecting the market citizens feel they lost control and they think they are ruled by the market I don't like this at all because these two things are completely different so why using the same word the second mission I had was to uh, open up economic sectors or industries that where there were too many, you know, monopolies or barriers from large, uh, you know, corporations in order to favor the development of the business. I mean, investments and jobs. We can still use the word reforms, uh, you know, the so-called reform of trade, electric electricity uh, system and then um, high-speed train system reform they triggered investments and new jobs especially for the youngest people so once again um, young people having the right diplomas. So many young people, you know, um, flocking into those industries, plus so many investments. And, uh, you know, people said, now, as for trade, there was no directive. I mean, there was a small document, something like 14 different, uh, you know, tables. Um, my father has uh, had a house. I come from a small village in the mountains. We rented, you know, the uh, ground floor to a person selling fruits and vegetables. So that person had to take courses to have the license. It was difficult, I mean, to, to manage uh, you know this you know difficult situation so those people had to take courses twice i remember the cost was around 300 euros so she had to take two courses so 20 years later i have changed i mean that bad practice i remember sort of revolts people say let's simplify things you don't have to simplify you have to remove them once again, when it comes to, you know, simplification, please pay attention. Sometimes uh, simplifying means that new standards are complicating things further. If you can do without, please let's do without. Let's get rid of something that doesn't work. As for the, uh, you know, power lines, so the electricity uh, reform, as we said, you know, these directives are not an obligation, they are an opportunity to solve problems we have. So if you can do it, just do something extra. So just, just do something more, not something less. 
So maybe you remember all of the incumbent systems. And the same happened in my government. Some people said that we can have NL plus the authorities controlling NL. No, 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 no. You really had to change the system. For example, high-speed train network. Europe said, let's uh, you know, liberalize, deregulate international goods transport. But if you want to do more, you can do more. We have liberalized the high-speed trains, and we are the only country in the world that are doing this. Uh, don't you like the system now with two train competitors? It was a big risk, I know. We said, we have the rails, right? We have the tracks. We also have to have trains. What can we do? I mean, do we, do, do, do we lay down new rails? No, we kept the same rails and we generated first time in the world competition between two different train companies. It was difficult. Uh, trade unions uh, knew about this. Uh, I'm talking about the trains. Uh, this means more jobs. As for energy, NL, one person told me, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, uh, I mean, a trade unionist told me, I've always protected NL. Now I have to change, I mean, my T-shirt and I have to write Genco. What, what can I tell my wife? Now, as for the canteens, um, you can tell your wife, well, I just have to stick to the IRI protocol just to guarantee jobs. You can also tell her that the minister is crazy. So I, I can't tell you more than this. So there have been no strikes. And we've been very happy of that change as well. Last point. I mean, there's a very basic point. Now, liberalization um, is sometimes matched with competition. Now, I want to say that you never do privatization without an industrial project concerning liberalization. Okay, so you can privatize after you liberalize because the outcome So, I think that this can be, you know, replicated in many different industries. For example, the access to the network has to be neutral. So, we have to be neutral in terms of accessing the markets or having the possibility to distribute services. And even services have to be competing against each other concretely. Okay, so... So... Of course, so I can't have a monopolist plus other competing services. And we have to have an authority uh, to protect uh, uh, both companies and citizens so that rules can be complied with. So... Let me also tell you that uh, if you don't protect, you know, companies, um, they manage to grow. Uh, any, so ENI or NL and the, uh, you know, the railway system. So in those cases of sectors, for example, telecom or motorways, uh, you saw what happened. So... As far as this principle is concerned, please let's 
Remember that this is the way it works. Don't forget it. Silvia Sciorilli Borrelli, the journalist. Oh, I have a question for you. The question sounds like a provocation. Now, Mr. Bassani talked about something that happened in 2007, so many years ago. So my question for you, Silvia, is why don't we talk about the advantages of competition in this country because we can all take advantage of this. We need an open, equitable market, a transparent rules for all the operators of the market. Well, Baldo, thank you so much and thank you for being here today. I really would like to thank you, the European Commission, for inviting me here. My answer is a question. Why is it so difficult here to approve laws on competition? We said competition is one of the key drivers of the uh, National um, Recovery and Resilience Plan. Some European funds depend on the approval of a law on competition. So the Draghi government, the Meloni government, got stuck on this law. Previous speakers told us why. Um, there are some interests that clash, apparently, uh, against other interests. So competition is something that has to be given to citizens so the citizens can take advantage of this, which is what uh, Mr. Paul and Mr. Bassani told us. The point is, the problem is, there are different interests that clash into each other. Corporation level interest, for example, here in Italy we have, you know, the taxi drivers, uh, uh, beach services, um, railway system, uh, motorways, uh, banks. Uh, j just take the example of uh, you know, Telecom Italia. Now we have the high speed, uh, which is now uh, one of the key drivers of the Italian economy, and it is an example for the rest of European countries. But at the very beginning, you know, uh, soon after the liberalization, when we started using Italo, so the trains from the competition, in Rome, I mean, they didn't want to have those trains in the main station. So reforms are never easy to be um, implemented and even to be digested, unless you have the right political will, which is what Mr. Bassani had at that time. Now, these rules have to be mixed and they have to live with um, you know, a, a legislation on competition plus something else. They have to work with the laws of the labor market, uh, the tax systems, uh, not just in Italy but also in the rest of Europe. So if this integration system doesn't work, uh, um, it is easy for uh, the politics uh, to say that, you know, they, they cannot go on with their privileges you know, the, uh, let's say, the pie, you know, is becoming smaller and smaller. So, some people say, well, it's the fault of Europe, it's the fault of the rules. Now, this concerns Italy uh, deeply, profoundly, because probably we have difficulties in the labor market, salaries are not going up. Some young people found a job, but we also have a very high level of uh, juvenile unemployment rate. Let's say that we sort of, you know, helped uh, uh, you know, some politicians are so as to blame the reforms or the rules. The attempt to remove the privileges in inverted commas that for some, you know, categories, all of this is a sort of an archive. So this is something they have acquired. It's a habit. They know they can take advantage of this.
these events are important because when we talk about competition or European directives, um, we talk about complex matters based on international treaties or European treaties. They fit into a highly technical legislation. It is difficult to explain citizens why these rules are here to create a better, fairer economy that works better for everyone. So we need, you know, plain language, simple words to understand what happens in the life of citizens. A big effort has to be, uh, you know, implemented by politicians. People may think that, you know, the left uh, uh, complies with the rules of the government while liberals have different ideas. I mean, this is a vintage idea. Just look at the evidence. The point is, how can we, um, you know, find the right reforms to make everyone happy? So that citizens can count on a better market. European rules have to give us an opportunity, but at the same time, we have to go hand in hand with other reforms and measures. This means companies can work in the right competition system in the rest of Europe, giving us the benefits and the advantages that, that legislators want. This is difficult to do because, I mean, you know, sometimes people say, well, let's blame the rules. Italian citizens uh, are poorer. They are controlled by the market. So instead of, you know, getting freedom, we have less freedom. Some people may think this translates into less freedom. Well, this is a, you know, a temptation from some governments in the past because I know it's difficult, you know, to find the right agreement between different legislations and different sectors of the legislation. Thank you. Now, with Anna Argentati, uh, now, um, Anna works in the uh, Antitrust Authority in Rome. This is the agency for the control of the markets. So, may I ask Anna the following question, an actual, you know, example, story. So, what do competition authorities do? Please tell us about one example touching the life of people. Thank you, Baldo. Really would like to thank the city of Modena. It's a strong initiative, so once again, it's fair. We need to talk about competition. When we say antitrust, the people think it's a difficult, you know, complex uh, system. So this is a great question. So I can share with you a um, couple of examples when it comes to competition. Apart from, you know, scientific studies. Now, um, all the actions of an antitrust system will produce beneficial effects, you know, for the community. Maybe you don't see this right away, but you know, they do turn into collective advantages, as we said before. Companies uh, have, you know, competition pressure, they stimulate innovation, they improve the quality of products. So once again, uh, we, we do have advantages uh, which turn into benefits for everyone. 
Now, some actions, if you will, can be perceived uh, in an easy way by uh, citizens. Um, I have, well, maybe not just one single case, but some cases we took care of some years ago. People liked it. I'm talking about some cases in the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, Roche and Novartis, for example. In 2022, we sanctioned a pharma group because of an abuse on anti-cancer drug. Maybe you remember the Aspen case from 2016. We sanctioned you know, an abuse of dominant position because of prices being too high. The sanction was for Aspen, which is a South African-based pharma company. They purchased, you know, the uh, marketing rights, the so-called Cosmos drugs. They started an aggressive negotiation with AIFA here in Italy to increase the prices. They said, well, if the negotiation doesn't work, the drugs would be reclassified This means that it would have been impossible to get the reimbursement. So in January 2014, uh, AIFA had, in a way, to accept these requests with a huge increase of the prices of those drugs plus 150%, in some cases plus 1,500%, completely unjustified drugs. They didn't pay for the production, they didn't do research. So there was no reasonable you know, justification for those prices. So this is an important example, and uh, you know this is a life-saving drug. Of course, uh, um, it all depends on you know the wealth of the patients. So we can't accept you know to uh, to turn this into a question of money. We also have Gladiant case in 2022 and many other cases. Um, this is important, in my opinion, for two reasons. And all of the antitrust, you know, breaches of the law, they really have to be stigmatized, I mean, sanctioned. But some of them are even stronger, if you will, or more important than many others. Um, you know, they have an impact on the rights of citizens. So the Antitrust Authority, ATA, has a key role. Uh, we strengthen you know, the guarantee uh, of uh, protecting fundamental rights. Second point, the protection of competition has one economic objective. I mean, this is uh, a sort of a helping hand for consumers. Um, indirectly, we also have other public objectives, the reducing inequalities, getting more equality. I mentioned drugs. I can also mention uh, antitrust interventions that favor the redistribution of extra profits from companies with antitrust breaches. We can also change the priorities we have. Uh, this is a power we got at the end of 2021, thanks to a European directive. If you choose which sectors you have to monitor more strictly, well, you can have an impact on the purchasing power. 
thus having a positive uh, you know, consequence in terms of redistribution of resources. This is not our number one priority, but these effects are absolutely fundamental for the community. So they are, if you will, self-explanatory examples of a beneficial um, you know, set of policies. This is what we do every day. Anna, thank you so much. May I now um, close the first round? Um, uh, Mrs. De Simone, you are representing the business community. You come from Tetra Park. Uh, the question is, can we have another tangible example? Um, we know that an open, well-regulated market uh, is good for innovation. Is it true? It's true. An open market with the right competition rules is absolutely good for innovation. Now, Tetra Pak is a company that deals with and packages food. So regulations are a key pillar for the food, even uh, agricultural industry. Uh, we have a natural predisposition to follow the rules, um, to protect food, but also rules to understand what to do in an industrial context. Tetra Pak is a multinational company. We are in many different countries. Rules change quite a lot. Market rules, the competition rules are so different. Now, in Europe, uh, of course, we want change, growth and improvement. So, Europe is an advanced context. It is highly structured. Competition is good for innovation. And I have an example of level playing field. Uh, let me talk about sustainability, which is what Europe is doing to uh, improve the climate neutrality of solutions brought to the market. These rules require big changes to our products. For example, just imagine the food packaging. We need to change the structure, the functionality, less plastics, more natural materials. This means research and innovation or research and development. This is an example. This is one of our uh, bricks. This is a single portion. It's white here, but I'm sure you must have seen it with a paper straw. You may have fruit juice or milk in. The European Union said in July 2021, this plastic um, straw has to disappear. Now, our customers are Coca-Cola, Nestle, and then we also have uh, Steri, Garda and Granarolo here in Italy. The price is so small. They can offer the right price to consumers. At the same time, they have a margin. Okay, in July 2021, this had to disappear. This was our reaction. We all thought of paper. I mean, Tetra Park and, and our competitors. We are the number one player, but fortunately we have competitions and competitors. So this is what we do, paper.
a paper straw. Uh, the technology is quite affordable. So we introduce it. From this very cheap solution, this is a costly solution. Much more expensive than plastics. Provata tutti, non è paragonabile. The functionality here cannot be compared to plastics. So we need to reduce costs, improve the functionality, big investments from Tetra Park and competitors to have a cheaper paper straw. So we had to increase prices. And unfortunately, margins went down. So, what can we do? People said, mm, well, maybe paper is no longer competitive enough. We need something different, functional and uh, cheaper, but also better in terms of functionality. We've uh, taken into account uh, our own technologies covered by intellectual property rights, which is what we use today for the bigger portions to 1 litre, 1.5 litres and 2 litres. Can we do the same for a small pack? So it depends on the technology we have in the filling machine so that we can really fit this plastic cap in the packaging. Now, it looks simple, but it is actually not. So, we look for the new pack, we change the design, we remove the paper straw. This has to be efficient, effective, cheap, functional, low cost. L'abbiamo ovviamente protetta immediatamente. So we developed it, we protected it, we patented it and we tested it with pilot customers. So customers think of the acceptability of the solution. Do people like it or dislike it? This is not uh, the final configuration. And uh, we also have price constraints. So that we can offer the right price, fair price to consumers with some margin. The margin means that we can maintain the company paying the employees and ensure the functionality of this solution. Now, this was a simple uh, example to tell you that uh, um, the rules of sustainability, but also the competition rules, uh, are the same for all. They have to be transparent and accessible. Innovation takes advantage of this because it is an incentive to look for something new, to explore new territories. You know, in my opinion, 
This is uh, an example of a healthy competition. I keep saying the word, you know, competizione in Italian, but it is not the right word. I'm really talking about competition in English. So once again, competition is an incentive to innovation. Allora, io vi, io vi ringrazio. Siamo arrivati alle 12.15, che è quando abbiamo deciso di eh, aprire le domande al pubblico. Ok, then. It is now a quarter past noon. Do we, need, do we need to take a short break? I don't think so. I don't think we need it. Let's start with you know, the Q&A session. This is our code for Slido, hashtag markets for people. You can also just raise your hand. So the debate will last for 15 minutes. Please wait for the hostess to get to the mic. Okay, I see a couple of hands up. Participare al dibattito. Qui. Prima Buongiorno, mi chiamo Mangiafico, mi rivolgo essenzialmente all'onorevole Bersani. I have a question for Mr. Bersani. No Terry Publics, in my opinion, are useless. And I know that you, are, you attempted to change the no Terry Public system and also you attempted reform on pharmacies. Ma guardi, di tutte le professioni, io ho qualche dubbio. Now, it's uh, difficult to change the notary public profession in Italy because um, it's a very strong group. Of course, there are so many things that should be changed, but I was not able to do this, but of course I, I couldn't do everything. Um, you know, one of the problems here is that, of course, I don't want to depress the professions, but I want sometimes to change them. You know, moving from the inefficiencies of the system towards the efficiency of the system. I have an example for you. So I asked, uh, you know, my collaborators, you know, can you see these are three columns? Here you can see a list of things that we can remove. At the center, what has to be strengthened. And here you can do the list of those that can be outsourced with the signature of a professional. For example, insurance companies, you know, uh, have plenty of, you know, sort of um, accounting to be done. You know, they, they need professionals to measure, you know, what happens on the road. So this is an example of, uh, uh, let's say, displacement or removal. So this means we can really do things in a very lean way. So some procedures may be outsourced quite easily. For example, just, just um, consider how long trials are. For example, a divorce a case. Um, it depends on you know on you know the price of these procedures. So. So I, I didn't want to punish, I mean, those, uh, you know, professionals, those professionals. So I just wanted to, to change them to help the public system to become more efficient. And, uh, you know, sometimes or quite often, they really, really, you know, earn money out of the inefficiencies or ineffectiveness of the, of the process. You know, maybe you remember a change, the, I mean, just a little thing. 
I remember very um, you know simple procedures. I mean something like 50 euros, uh, which is what we have to pay every time we change or replace our car. And the number of cars being sold, you know, in Italy every year is 2.5 million. So just imagine, you multiply 2.5 million cars, you know, and 50 euros each. Well, this is a lot of money. I remember I had a conversation with uh, an exporter, I mean, uh, a big company here, and, uh, and I said, uh, is it possible to have bags being so expensive? And he told me, of course we need quality, yes, of course we need quality, this is the basic element. Now, if I manage to show the bag, and the bag is in the heads of uh, you know, Sharon Stone, I mean, the price is just a consequence. So the price is what a person is, uh, you know, available to pay, willing to pay. But you know, the situation is different when it comes to cancer. So we need to make a distinction. So we really, really need to understand what to change because so uh, if you don't have enough money and you can't buy that bag for your wife, well, this is it. If this is not a problem. But if you don't have the money to, I mean, for your cancer, well, the situation is different. So please, uh, you know, don't forget this situation. This is impossible. I mean, when inflation goes up, we are number one, and then we, we can't make it go down. So there's something that doesn't work. And so, once again, I'm really, really, I mean, encouraging you to think about this. Now, uh, if at all possible, and before giving the floor to another person for another question, may I invite all the speakers here on the floor to uh, maybe exchange questions among them? Because, of course, all of this is so interesting, starting from Professor Polo. Do you have a question for other speakers? A very, very short, I mean, um, feedback, I mean, after, you know, the first round of, of presentations. So many of the examples we have shared, including, for example, those represented by the so-called bad linen uh, reform, um, so they, they concern, I mean, services in general. And uh, there was another example, an interesting one, from... Tetra Pak's CEO, of course, she talked about production or manufacturing goods. Now, I'm thinking of a diagram, I mean, of some figures, talking about the impact of competition or even the effect of the lack of competition. Ura della efficienza e dell'innovazione guardando al settore eh, industriale so just consider the industrial sector which is exposed directly to our international competition and uh, you know Tetra Pak is uh, a great example of this so you can also consider the services sector which is typically protected Uh, because of, oh, well, against the competition from foreign um, suppliers. Now, that diagram of those numbers are impressive. In the uh, uh, last 20 years, uh, if you measure the efficiency of innovation, well, this level goes up for industry, but it goes down for services. So, the economy is not growing, but this is an average. So. On the one side, we have competition, and of course, I mean, we do react, we do improve products. And uh, they are, you know, becoming cheaper for users. And a sector that in general is protected against or from this international competition. And it finds different ways to guarantee margins. For example, we uh, squeeze salaries, and then there are some other forms of weak competition between different operators. So the uh, 
top-level liberalization policies tried to change this situation. This is really, really interesting. Thank you for this, because we have the so-called forced consumption when it comes to services. What do we mean by obliged to consumption? So, uh, this concerns the millions and millions of people, and um, let's say the opportunistic or defensive practices are very easy. You know, you just have to, uh, you know, change, you know, one um, production process just a little bit. No one realizes. If someone realizes, uh, do you think, uh, you know, they get crazy, they, they go to the lawyer, maybe they see the problem in, without doing anything. This is why we need the public control on these measures. I mean... Of course, we do respect, you know, entrepreneurs or providers, but of course, uh, this is what they do every single day. While, I mean, citizens, you know, maybe they are worried just when you receive the bill, maybe local politicians don't think about this, you know. So, one of the things that I really, really would like to uh, criticize in the current government is the following. You have a Ministry of Economy, so this is not the Ministry of Industry. This is the ministry where they talk about production, distribution, and consumption. So on a permanent basis, you know, what they are supposed to do is to control, you know, these three pillars. So I had, you know, put together a structure. I mean, uh, an office, you know, consumers associations, the plus a department controlling this. Uh, So I can also tell you, I mean, how many, um, you know, solutions have been found to bypass regulations. You know, so when you are a manufacturer, well, of course, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, so many competitors. And as for services, well, you know, they are forced services. And in some cases, the, you know, the mechanisms of the so-called competition uh, cannot just be understood by people and, you know, ordinary citizens or users just don't understand them because they can be bypassed as easily as one, two, three. So I think it's a huge issue, a very serious problem. Once again, uh, well, unless you have some, you know, daily focus on this, uh, you can't get out of this situation. You know, people told me, well, you cannot do this because you will have an impact on the market. And I said, are you joking? Um, this is what I said before, you know, in terms of mortgages. Which kind of market is it? I mean, we have a winner and a loser. This is not a market. So what are we talking about? I mean, I can't accept you have winners and losers on the market. So um, authorities have a fundamental role to play. But, you know, once again, we need standards. We need the regulation, okay? Uh, if you really, really want, uh, I mean, people to act, sorry for this interruption, which is what just happened with the Digital Market Act, DMA. So after many years of cases, we now have a standard. I have a question from Slido. Uh, I don't know who the question is for, but I think it's for Sylvia. This is Franco. He mentioned the uh, Uber problem. So, in, uh, you know, uh, we, we can, you know, move uh, um, for a very cheap price. Why can't we solve the problem? Where's competition? Now, as for Uber, I'm sure you remember very briefly, in Italy we had this, this big, uh, uh, you know, problem, and then, you know, the uh, manager and director of Uber went back to London. Um, she's Italian, she was in London. She, she was threatened to death, and then in London she launched a startup. Now, these are, you know, the, the small interests from small, you know, sectors. It's a pity, you know, because, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to always, you know, point my finger to the same category. We always keep talking about, you know, taxi drivers and then the beach services providers. And I'm sorry, but once again, there's lack of political will. 
because you, you, you maybe I remember, you know, Rome held a hostage uh, by, you know, taxi drivers' strikes. And I also remember all the discussions when we decided or tried to introduce Uber. So, the, as we said before, the pie is always the same and slices are becoming smaller. But taxi drivers said that we paid for our licenses so much money. So if you open the market to Uber, I mean, they get in with very low prices. So how can I pay for my licenses? Now, this is a problem we had in every single country. Uh, I have lived in London for many years. I worked for uh, a TV channel and I talked about, you know, the, uh, you know, um, strikes from the London cabs, which are so expensive. And uh, so it was only possible to pay cash. They didn't want to pay with a card. You had to pay 70 pounds and you had to pay cash. And they just, I mean, uh, they, they blocked the Trafalgar Square because they didn't really want Uber. Then there was a dialogue with the UK government. We had Bolt, Uber and other, you know, transport apps similar to Uber. So there was a sort of an, an, even, an even bigger opening of that market. In Italy, we don't have the political will to do this. It shows, I mean, it's very evident. For example, for taxi drivers, you know, they can strike maybe very close to the strike of public transport, for example, on Friday afternoon. And then, you know, the uh, you know, credit cards uh, uh, issue uh, has been turned into a political issue with plenty of fakes. So they are not forced, I mean, to accept payment with a credit card. But, you know, all of these measures, uh, you know, lower or maybe restricts, you know, the competition to protect the interests of that category. So, it is an important category. So, in a nation where we have an election every 1.5 years to, to have a new parliament, so uh, this doesn't allow us to do all the reforms or to do the changes which is painful at the beginning, I know, and I know it has an impact on the interests of someone. We need uh, more political stability and the political will to do reforms. People don't like it at the very beginning. Citizens, uh, you know, or, I mean, have to digest them. But then, um, you know, eventually it works. You have Uber in, in Madrid and uh, many other European countries which are economically similar to Italy. These steps are required, so steps forward, not steps backward. So we're now working on opening competition because now people are, you know, sort of, you know, moving back. We are not opening. Where's competition? This is the final part of the question. So, as Mr. Polo and Sylvia said before, liberalizations or deregulations have social costs, but also political costs, which are very high. You know, competition produces mid-term effects, but then politicians give, you know, uh, protections to the requests of the present times. Now, the Antitrust Authority, some years ago, highlighted a very interesting point. I mean, the need to, uh, you know, support uh, the deregulation policies with other public policies that can help competition, social, you know, security policies, uh, requalification of jobs, active uh, labor policies. So just think you are risking to be laid off. 
or even the taxi driver that has to change the business model and the digital revolution. I understand they, uh, you know, uh, reject uh, reforms. Well, competition policies may be, you know, digested a little better in the minds and in the hearts of citizens. So, we don't want to see people, you know, protesting or protectionism. Of course, everyone says protectionism is not the answer to the problem, but they are one of the consequences of the, uh, you know, bad social situation. So, of course, this is what politicians should be doing, because, of course, what we all want is uh, benefits, especially long-term benefits. Okay, we're very close to the end of our works this morning. We have time for one question. Uh, Mr. Collar, thank you for joining us. Maybe you want to close so with just one quick word. Now, competition and its rules are at the service of society. I don't believe in this. In my opinion, the situation is different. We should rephrase the sentence. The society at the service of competition. Competition for me means profits. Behind profits, I see big multinational companies and big financial companies. I'm sharing this with you because of globalization. And my question is, uh, why globalization? Who's taking advantage of this? Who forced governments or states to accept the globalization? Because I don't see any advantage out of globalization. Who did this? Maybe uh, you know, big financial companies imposed this. Once again, because of globalization, Italy is now the country that uh, didn't take advantage out of globalization at all. For example, we have high costs for our products here in Italy and the same products from China cost 50% less than our prices. I have the impression that globalization is something so bad for the Italian society. So to keep, if you will, the pace of competitors, young people find that uh, difficult to find the right contracts, professional contracts. Um, thank you for your question, which is a big, big question, but it's uh, really off, off topic. Uh, it's, it's, my, it's my opinion, okay? So, Professor Polo, you know, had to, you know, close. I don't think we can answer this complex question. Well, of course, um, you touched upon so many different topics. Now, competition means an increase of uncertainty. And I know the, let's say, China situation. 
This also means a compression, I mean, of uh, labor conditions. You know, here in Europe, I know that we have, you know, uh, a different history in terms of, you know, labor relationships with a high level of guarantees and many other countries that don't have the same protection networks. But this is the dark side of the processes we went through that you have highlighted in your, in your uh, question. At the same time, this system allows us to buy goods and services at an affordable price and we wouldn't be able to purchase them otherwise. You know, so at the same time we have these, you know, ups and downs or, you know, uh, lights and shadows. So we have to keep the advantages, if you will, of the system. I mean, as consumers. At the same time, we have to, you know, come to terms with costs. I know what you mean. Uh, workers, you know, being uh, fired, uh, taxi drivers that find it difficult to pay for the license that they had purchased. So, this is the side where competition um, moves to a high level of uncertainty. Now, the traditional mechanisms were a mixed system, for example, unemployment benefits, plus new mechanisms, uh, for example, uh, trade unions. So, trade unions went down in terms of strength or power. Budget policies, I mean, budgets have been slashed. So, today, we have a globalization process. So we have a reduction of collective guarantees and protection systems that we can get in this world uh, with a higher level of uncertainty. So this is the idea of the social economy, which is typical of Europe. I mean, guaranteeing the advantages of competition, but at the same time offering a, a social protection network that doesn't expose, you know, citizens to the risk of, you know, losing their job or, you know, uh, worsening the conditions of their contracts. This is today's major challenge. If we win this challenge, also competition will find consensus. Thank you, Professor Apollo. Um, Sylvia. I just wanted to say that um, apart from, you know, pointing our finger to globalization, please don't forget that we live in a country that in the years where it grew, I mean, we grew with public debt. So we are in the European level. So this level now is no longer sustainable and it generates other problems because the economic growth didn't, let's say, experience the same pace. Um, it's because of reforms of the labor market or all of the you know, constraints and pressure so as to you know, make the labor market as flexible as possible. Now it has turned into a precarious market. Other European countries have implemented competition with some sacrifice. I mean, they have the regulatory um, framework. They don't have the same problems we have here. Um, they don't have low salaries, as low as they are here, or the uh, you know unemployment rate that we have here in. Italy. We need to understand uh, um, how necessary some reforms are. The world is globalized, so Europe cannot be, you know, uh, squeezed between China and the U.S. We should be having more competition 
and uh, we have to become even more European. Uh, there's a new legislation approved two months ago, uh, the CHIPS Act, in order to make uh, chips in Europe. <coughs> this is the only thing we can do, um, of course. Uh, not just in Italy, uh, but also in Europe. Well, Europe has to be right at the center. US on the one side, China on the other side, but all together, so that the scale will be more competitive. I mean, if we keep, you know, blaming people, or, you know, uh, just thinking of the past, I mean, we will succumb. Okay, just just a, a follow-up answer. Uh, in my opinion, competition is not a problem. From the industrial point of view, um, competition is fundamental. What you have just said, I mean, making semiconductors or chips in Europe is a very important example of what the crisis taught us. This crisis forced us in many sectors to understand what we can do. I mean, uh, I mean something different. How can we join forces to solve global problems because they have impacted negatively on the real economy. Once again, competition is positive. Healthy competition, regulated competition, really means uh, encouraging innovation, uh, strengthening uh, the, 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 I mean, looking for solutions to real problems. Globalization was a need, so we couldn't avoid it. Now, after what happened last year, people are now talking about the deglobalization. So let's see what will happen. Maybe we had a strong globalization. We will have a partial, you know, slow pace, the deglobalization to support markets and the economy. I'm not talking about products, I'm not talking about services, but just think of competition as an encouragement, an incentive to do more, to do different. And uh, we need to look for solutions. Complaining doesn't help us. Back to the mortgage. We need to have an impact on the market. We need to change the market, especially when some big things happen. There's a dumping mechanism. So there has been some internal dumping, I mean, proliferation of contracts and uh, deregulation mechanisms and precarious mechanisms are something like really crazy. So we need to really, really change the market. Absolutely, we need a regulatory barrier. Trade unions by themselves cannot do this. We need a law on the negotiation, removing precarious jobs, um, equal pay, so this is what we absolutely need now. So that the whole system can be a high quality one. I agree. Globalization has a dark side with plenty of thorns and splinters. Now, we don't need to deglobalize. We need to regulate the globalization. Don't forget one important detail. Italy has been doing the same things for 1,000 years. We process raw materials that we don't have into top quality products that the whole world wants. 
This is what we do here. So we have the belts, the, you know, goldsmith, we don't have gold. We have the best cheese, we don't have the goats, so to say. The best, you know, automotive in the world, that we don't have iron. I mean... We can't live without, uh, you know, open markets. Now, protectionism doesn't work in Italy, and it's been like this for 1,000 years. Second point. Um, so, what is the real raw material that we've always had? Uh, the quality of what we do here, so the quality of, you know, entrepreneurs, of our services, I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be able to be great uh, in turning raw materials that we don't have into the best products in the world. And what we need is, a, I mean, what we have here is a high level of mental flexibility. So are we sort of reproducing all of these skills? Are we doing this for our young people? So what are we doing to make sure this system will continue? Okay, uh, we have, you know, our precarious jobs, I know. But right now, uh, you know, uh, many, many jobs are precarious jobs. So we're throwing away the only raw material that we have. So right now, this is the main issue of this country. Now, Uber is um, getting into some agreements with some taxi drivers. I mean, the strongest ones. So they really, I mean, fought in the street. And now they come to an agreement. You know, the question is, where is the world going? Well, the world is going towards a system where, you know, well, in some cases you need a chauffeur, sometimes you need a taxi, sometimes you need Uber. Why? Because this is what is happening. Consumers control the market. So all of these apps will, you know, uh, broaden the offer. So why don't we have an industrial project based on this? So if you have gas pipes, I mean, the gas pipes, you know, uh, transport, if you will, gas or dispatch gas to everyone, an individual, a family, a small company, a big company. So we just have two players. We have the gas pipes on the one side and we have consumers on the other. The pipe will be turned into an app, if you understand what I mean. And people will say, okay, today I need a chauffeur, today I need a taxi, today I need a ticket on the train. The difference is, who's going to do this? A private company? Or maybe a public app with a fair competition, fair competition, no monopoly. So... People using the app uh, have to have specific features. We have to have, you know, uh, some services or quality services, okay? Otherwise, the authority will punish them. First, we have to digitalize the public administration. Okay, you just need an app. You can do this. More than I can do this. So, of course, this public app will be winning. As for the uh, so-called beach concessions, so we've been, you know, working on this for 10 years. There's, there are always, you know, postponements in every single government.
Okay, it's the logic of reasoning. So, do we want to protect, you know, those beach services providers? The point is different. Which kind of beach do we want? Maybe you can have a sort of a competition with, you know, small and medium companies. Se è questo, non venirmi a dire che arriva il la, la major. I don't think we can have, you know, an American major coming here. You know, the tenders have to be very specific. I will have some guarantees for investments. I will put a limit to the number of concessions, which is what we do for pharmacies. Someone may be in trouble, and we can help those small companies, but you have to start from the industrial project. Once again, we need a ministry of real economy. The task is to measure, you know, the industrial profile of every single topic. This is the only way out. And now we will have the inflation problem. Investments are now frozen. Just think of, you know, dealers and, you know, uh, they don't know what to do. We can do this with no major impact. We also have compensation interventions. So, as we said before, um, maybe we will have, you know, 200, 300 single individual cases where you may have a problem. Not, not thousands and thousands of cases. Okay, it's really very late, so we need another meeting. Allora, il dibattito mi, mi piange il cuore, finisce qui. So sorry to say that the meeting is over. Okay, Mr. Collar, can we have your final considerations? Then we continue with our conversation. Eh, Vado veloce. <laughs> Ma intanto argomento notevole, indispensabile. E potrei dire questo. Let me say that competition is always horizontal, it is never vertical. So, Pier Luigi. I think we were born in the same year. I mean, they don't want us in Lombardy, they don't want us in Emilia-Romagna. It's always a war. You know, even the flag or bed linen um, protests were interesting at that time, you know. Taxi drivers, uh, constitutional freedom, financial, uh, you know, regulations, uh, concessions. I mean, we talked about so many different interesting things. Anyway, this being said, I mean, I believe in globalization. Emilia Romagna is in the world. Uh, I mean, of course, I, I don't want to, to, to answer that complex question, but Emilia Romagna is in the world. If we didn't have the possibility to export all what we export, this wouldn't be Emilia-Romagna. In 2021, this country's value added was 46 billion euros. This region did 23 billion euros. I 
I'd like to have more multinational companies here, not one less. The very, very hot topic, a very decisive topic, is that politics uh, has to be positive, not negative. I believe in Europe and uh, so if you move your company to Ireland or even in the Netherlands to pay less taxes, if I'm not able to redistribute those revenues, I mean, of course, no one is able to do this. Only Europe can make this decision. The, I mean, history of Europe has always been like this. So they've always been able to do redistribution. And with that the redistribution, they did the best loyal competition operation, creating welfare, health, school system. This is the uh, most important point uh, today. I think there's uh, um, a never seen before change. We also need to understand uh, uh, how quickly technologies are changing. You have to govern technologies. Otherwise, it polarizes. It creates some you know, top managers and wealthy people, and on the bottom, you have um, you know, so many poor people. In this region, we've always had the political capacity to be strong enough so that we can hold and we can have a high, you know, democratic and institutional participation. Competition is a political topic. If we are able to, let's say, deflate the bubble, this is one of our targets. So labor has to be at the center of all of our policies. Otherwise, people would complain. There is no political participation. So people will change their mind. Competition is political. It's a political issue. This is the point, the key point of our discussion. I told Stefano Bonaccini, the president of the of the region, we just wanted to think of the future, where the world is going to understand where our region is going. We are changing politics and institutions. We took the Laudato Si, COP21, now COP27. So from the fiscal compact, now we have next generation EU, then recovery, then Green Deal. And I agree with that positioning of Europe. This is unavoidable. Because the young people are much more globalist than we are. And they can really, really uh, express that they are new needs. If we don't understand this change, uh, we will, you know, step back and we would become too local, too regional. So, this is what we are doing. I visited a big company some days ago. They make fans for radiators. And the owner told me, we make the best ones. So, this is a plastics, but also a chemical company. It's true, 
the only problem is I have competitions. I mean, the competition is not how good they are in doing the fan. Before designing, in America, they have law firms to protect the patent so that when I go to the market, I can attack your patent because I know mine is stronger. This is what competition is. The possibility to do regulation or a mediation between technology and humanities. It all depends on the way we want our community. So, we know the demographics of this country, no raw materials, flat demographics. Of course, we are, I mean, the situation is worsening. So, demographics doesn't belong to the left or to the right. So, so there's a bright new world that's coming up. This new world, I mean, the way we discuss. So, it is the quality of life of a democratic country. We want to be a big manufacturing country, otherwise it would all spiral us down. Quality is the real idea, and of course we have to have competition, especially in terms of quality. So, these are the factors that we are positioning in this region. But of course we need more than one region, more than one country. We need Europe. I love Europe. Uh, we need to fill some gaps. So there's plenty of things to do. We understood that we can be big, great manufacturers also here in Europe. In Bologna, there's the biggest European investment done. So fortunately, we have it here. This is a big bet from Europe because, you know, you know, Silicon Valley and Chinese, they had technology, private technology. If we are able to offer an integrated public-private system, this is what we need to do. So this is an integrated system. This is a long transition. We need to be loyal in defining the public role. A company doesn't work with a good school, good health, cannot survive. So competition is all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really would like to thank all of you here in the room. Um, we have food here on the right for all of you. Okay, see you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Arrivederci.